Hello, I am Mati van Oef and I'm going to present the paper Dragon Blood, analyzing the Dragonfly handshake of WPA3 on the EAP PWD, and this is joint work with E.L. Ronan. If we look at the history of Wi-Fi, we see that initially they relied on web for security. Unfortunately, this protocol was quickly shown to be completely broken, and in response to this, they released WPA, which was based on a draft of the IEEE standard. Once the IEEE standard was finalized, the Wi-Fi Alliance released WPA2. Unfortunately, this algorithm is vulnerable to offline password brute force attacks, and recently it has also been shown vulnerable to key reinstallation attacks. In response to these two weaknesses, WPA3 was released, which internally uses the Dragonfly handshake. And the Dragonfly handshake previously was also used in EAP PWD, and EAP PWD is an authentication algorithm of enterprise Wi-Fi networks where you authenticate using a username and a password. And Dragonfly is what we call a PIC, and it provides the usual properties. It provides mutual authentication, and it negotiates a fresh session key. And more importantly, Dragonfly defends against offline dictionary attacks in contrast to WPA2. So how does the Dragonfly handshake work? Well, before executing the Dragonfly handshake, the password, which may be stored in ASCII or in Unicode, needs to be converted into a so-called group element P. And this group element can then be used in the cryptographic calculations of the handshake. And once this is done, we can execute the first phase of the handshake, which is called the commit phase. And without going into too much detail, the commit phase negotiates the session key between both peers. The second phase consists of the confirm phase, and essentially this phase is used to confirm that both peers negotiated the same key, which also proves that they both possess the password. Now, the important question here is how can we derive P from a password. And how this is done depends on which specific cryptographic group is used in the Dragonfly handshake. And in our case, and in this presentation, we will focus on elliptic curves. So the question becomes, how can we convert the password into a point on the elliptic curve? And this is generally done using a hash to group function. And one naive way to do this is to simply hash the password together with the MAC addresses of the client on the access point and use the resulting value as the X coordinate of the point on the elliptic curve. Unfortunately, not all X values lie on the curve. In particular, only half of the X values lie on the curve. For the other half, we need to find the solution. And what did the designers decide to do? Well, they included a hash function. And in case the X value does not result in a Y value, in that case, we simply execute a new iteration with the counter incremented by one, which results in a new X value that hopefully does lie on the curve. Now, some of you may already see the problem here. The problem is that the number of executions that are performed by this algorithm now depend on the password and also on the public MAC addresses. And perhaps what's most surprising is that the IETF and the CFRG warned that this will create side channels in the algorithm. Unfortunately, the designers discarded these side channels because they thought they were theoretic and that they would not leak the password of the network. Unfortunately, this side channel does allow an adversary to perform an offline dictionary allow an adversary to perform an offline dictionary attack. So how can we cover how can we recover the password based on the number of iterations that are executed? Well, we have two at attack scenarios. The first attack scenario is that we can act as a malicious access point and we can induce client, clients into connecting to us or we can pretend to be a malicious client and attack uh, um, access point. In both cases, we will measure how many iterations that the other device is executing. For example, if we attack an access point, 
we will spoof a client MAC address of A, and let's say that we can measure how many iterations the access point is executing. And on our example, it is executing two iterations. We can then execute the hash to group uh, algorithm offline for the passwords in our dictionary, and we can then and we can then exclude passwords for which the number of iterations do not match our observation. Now, unfortunately, using one MAC address is not sufficient because it does not filter out all passwords in our dictionary. In our example, two passwords are still possible. So we need more information. Now, where do we get that information? Well, if we look at the algorithm, we can see that the MAC addresses influence the execution of the algorithm. So what we can do is we can spoof a different client MAC address and again measure how many iterations that the access point executes. For example, we can spoof MAC address B, we can measure that the access point now executes one iteration, we again execute the hash to group algorithm uh, offline, and we can exclude passwords that do not match our observation. And we continue spoofing MAC addresses at the network. So what is the complexity of this uh, attack? Well, let's say that we want to uniquely determine the password in the Rocky database dump. Then on average, we will need to spoof around 17 MAC addresses. And this results in a fairly efficient algorithm. And one of the main takeaway message, messages here is that the number of iterations that are executed for a given set of MAC addresses forms a signature of the password. Now, there is one thing that I haven't explained yet, and that is, can we indeed measure how many iterations that an access point or a client executes? And to answer this, we attacked a Raspberry Pi 1B, which was running an open source uh, implementation, and we measured the number of iterations that are executed. And it, it turns out this is fairly easy to do. Against an EAP PWD client, we only need 30 measurements to determine how many iterations are being executed when we use Crosby's box test to filter out noise. So that covers the case of the EAP PWD algorithm. When they standardized WPA3, they did realize that this algorithm had uh, some side channel issues and they tried to prevent them. And the first thing they did with WPA3 is they always made the algorithm execute 40 iterations and return the first X and Y coordinate uh, that lies on the curve. On top of that, they checked whether the X value is on the curve using a blinded constant time test. Using a blinded constant time test. Additionally, they executed the extra iterations using a random password, again to reduce the chance of any possible side channels. Now, there is still one remaining problem, and that is that the hash output has to be truncated to the size of the prime p. So, for example, let's say that we are using a 256-bit elliptic curve, then the output of the hash function is truncated to the first 256 bits. However, this truncation is not always sufficient. In particular, if we use brain pool curves, then even if we truncate the hash output, there is still a high chance that the resulting x value is bigger than the prime of the curve. And we want to avoid that because it introduces a small bias into the subsequent to graphic calculations. So how did the designers decide to tackle this issue? Well, they used rejection sampling, which basically means that they included an if test to check if the x value is higher or equal to the prime, and if so, they simply execute another iteration. So now the question is, are all side channel leaks avoided? Unfortunately, they are not. The problem now is that this piece of code may now be skipped in an iteration. And more problematic is that the number of times that this code is skipped depends on the password. 
Now, this case is not as trivial to abuse as the EPWD case, because the number of times that this code is skipped depends on the real password, but also on the random password that is executed in these extra iterations. Nevertheless, we were able to uh, information to perform a offline dictionary attack. And the way we did this is by realizing that the variance of the execution time still depends on when the password element was found. For example, if the password element is found in the very first iterations, then all the other iterations are executed based on a random password, meaning there's a high amount of variance in the execution time. While if the password element is found in the last iteration, then there are no extra iterations based on a random password, meaning the variance is zero. And on top of that, this, the average execution time also depends on when the password was found and the number of times that this code was skipped. So now the question is, can we measure these things in practice? And we again performed an experiment against a Raspberry Pi that was running an open source experiment against a Raspberry Pi that was running an open source implementation of WPA3. And in this case, we had to make more timing measurements. We had to make 300 timing measurements. But when making these measurements, we again were able to uh, obtain enough information to perform an, an offline dictionary attack. Now, apart from these timing attacks, we also discovered cache attacks against implementations of the Dragonfly handshake. And the advantage of these cache attacks is that um, so these cache attacks can be performed in the following attack scenario, where we pretend to be a malicious access point and the client is tricked into running unprivileged uh, code. This can, for example, be accomplished by tricking the victim into installing uh, an Android application that does not have any special privileges. The advantage of the cache attack is that it works even when the Dragonfly handshake is executed using NIST elliptic curves. Because when we were using NIST curves, there is a very low chance that the X value will be higher than the prime P, meaning we cannot use our timing attacks. However, using cache attacks, we can detect if when the, when the group element P is found. Namely, we use flush and reload to detect uh, when this piece of code is executed. And this allows us to determine whether the password was found in the first iteration or in a subsequent iteration. And the key takeaway message here is that our cache attacks again uh, form a signature of the password, which can be used to brute force a dictionary. And we implemented the brute force algorithm. And here we found that if you take any uh, dictionary or any password leak, then we can brute force it for less than $1 on Amazon uh, instances. And even if you want to brute force all eight symbol passwords, then the cost will be higher, but it's still doable in practice. Now, apart from this, we also discovered Wi-Fi specific attacks. The first one is that is a denial of service attack. And this is caused by uh, the computational complexity of the Dragonfly handshake. Namely, always having to execute these 40 iterations is very computationally intensive, and this can be abused by an adversary. On top of this, we, discover on top of this, we discovered downgrade attacks when uh, a network simultaneously supports WPA2 and WPA3. In that case, we can downgrade a client into using WPA2, and WPA2 will in fact detect that a downgrade is happening and it will abort the handshake. However, even the partial WPA2 handshake that is performed is enough to perform the traditional dictionary text against WPA2. On top of that, the Dragonfly handshake can be executed using multiple elliptic curves 
on there is no proper protection against downgraded tags, meaning we can trick a client or an access point into using a weaker elliptic curve than they normally would. So how did we disclose these results? Well, we notified the Wi-Fi lines and they privately created best compatible security guidelines. Unfortunately, their guidelines contained a mistake. Namely, they were still advising the use of brain pool curves. So in a second disclosure, we also showed how brain pool curves can be exploited. And at the end of last year, they updated their security guidelines to now also prohibit brain pool curves. On top of that, their security advice guidelines uh, are also a bit vague in our opinion. For example, they state that uh, Dragonfly must be implemented without any side channels. But of course, that's very difficult to do without explicit examples on how to do this. Additionally, their guidelines state that if WPA3 in transition doesn't meet your security guides, then separate passwords. Unfortunately, they don't really say what they mean with uh, it not meeting the security requirements. So these guidelines are a bit fake. Problematic is that Dragonfly is still very hard to implement in constant time. And on lightweight devices, doing the 40 iterations is also too costly. In fact, in practice, we see some devices that indeed only execute, uh, for, ex for instance, eight, operation, eight iterations. Another issue, but fortunately, the good news is that the IEEE standard is being updated. It is now being updated to use a constant time hash to curve algorithm. They are prohibiting the usage of weak crypto groups. They are preventing uh, crypto group downgrade attacks. And they also allow a partial offline computation of the password element. Now, even with these updates, uh, some issues remain. The first is that the message transcript is not included in the key derivation. And this prevents a formal proof of the protocol, and it also inter inter incre increases the risk of implementation issues where an implementer might forget to uh, include the relevant downgrade defenses. More problematic is that downgrade attacks may still be possible as well because the downgrade attack to WPA2 is not addressed in the standard and it is left up to uh, implementers. In this case, we see that Android and the network manager of Linux is implementing a trust on first use uh, principle where if they previously connected using WPA3 with a certain network, they will not fall back to using WPA2 in the future. A final risk is that these updates to the IEEE standard are not backwards compatible. So there remains a risk that devices can be downgraded from the updated WPA3 standard to the original WPA3 standard. And I conclude uh, my talk. We have shown that WPA3 is vulnerable to side channels. The countermeasures against it are costly, and because of this, the IEEE has now uh, updated the draft standard. And perhaps the most important takeaway message is that these issues could have been avoided if the designers would have followed the advice of the ITF on CFRG and used an alternative hash to curve algorithm. Thank you for your attention.